from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Learn more at aarp.org wv. The Charleston Gazette Mail, using its CGM app to deliver the latest news, traffic, and weather alerts, keeping you in the know while you're on the go. Lumos Networks, online at lumosnetworks.com. Marshall University, with more than 100 degree programs offered in four locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. Orion Strategies, professional public relations, government affairs, creative services, and research and polling with offices in Charleston, Buchanan, Martinsburg, Pittsburgh, and Columbus. Good evening and welcome to the Legislature Today. I'm Suzanne Higgins here with senior reporter Dave Mistich at the Capitol Building. Dave, a really busy day today. We're exactly two weeks in and we saw the passage of a centerpiece uh, of legislation out of the Senate, Senate Bill 1, the Community and Technical College tuition assistance bill. That's right, uh, and it passed unanimously 34 to 0. Uh, the Senate, you know, obviously that means bipartisan support. The Senate, uh, everyone over there are very excited about this. There are some questions about where it's going to go in the House, but we're going to take a look at what uh, Senate, Senate President Mitch Carmichael had to say about that bill. It provides for the P- employees of West Virginia, the employers, a drug-free, trained workforce that enables our people, this state in which we have low workforce participation and uh, one among the lowest educational attainment levels in America. This bill addresses both those issues and changes the face of West Virginia forever. And there is, you know, a lot of fanfare, a lot of excitement to that. Um, I'd mentioned that there's some questions about where this is going to go in the House. Um, But, you know, one of the things that we kept hearing over and over again, this was on the the amendment stage yesterday. They struck down some amendments. They kept calling it a good first step. So we kept hearing that a lot from the Senate. Uh, Maybe that bill will change or that law will change in the future. But a lot of excitement over there today. It was also Sexual and Domestic Violence Awareness Day today. It's some horrific Uh, Crimes were detailed in conversations uh, by survivors and advocates. They're asking for a half a million dollars for domestic violence programs and a survivor's bill of rights. Uh, Let's listen to Nancy Hoffman. She's with the West Virginia Foundation for Rape and Information Services. In 2017, 7% of West West Virginia's high school students that were surveyed said that they had been experienced unwanted sexual dating violence. Those are West Virginia statistics, already 7% of our high school students. And our campus survey that we conducted on um, nine campuses last spring, we found that almost 20% of our campuses, our students reported having unwanted sexual contact while they were in college and they reported that 21 percent had re- had been uh, sexually uh, abused prior to coming to college. So our needs keep increasing, yet our rape crisis centers have had a 75 percent decrease in funding since 2012. In my book, victims took one for the state. Also today, Dave, a, a, major, uh, a measure, rather, an effort to repeal the business inventory, machinery, and equipment tax cleared a major hurdle. That's right. Um, House Joint Resolution 17 passed through the House Finance Committee this morning. Um, that resolution looks to repeal the business inventory, machinery, and inf- uh, equipment tax, as you mentioned. Um, that's about 250 to 300 million in revenue. Now, all that goes to public education, county commissions, municipal governments, as well as you know, some, a very small portion of that comes back to the state. Um, with it being a joint resolution, it would require a two-thirds majority of both chambers and then a vote of the general public as a ballot measure to, make, to amend the Constitution. Uh, details of how that would happen, uh, exactly which businesses would be subject, um, whether or not it would be a phase-out, 
All that has not been set in stone, not part of the resolution. So those details would come in uh, after a vote of the general public and be left to the, to the legislature starting in 2021 to decide. Delega, Delegate Isaac Spinagle, he's a Democrat, um, he voted against the bill passing out of committee. He expressed some concerns over leaving it to be decided later. A half a plan is not a full plan, and that's what we have right now. Half a plan changed the Constitution because that's what's required. Uh, and there's, it's just moot in regards to is it going to be paid for? Is it going to be net or income neutral? Uh, how you're going to go about that? You're just going to leave it to a future legislature. I don't feel comfortable doing that. I think we need to see a full vision of how you're going to take it out. I think everybody agrees it's bad tax, and ideally you wouldn't have it. But likewise, I don't know how you're going to pay for that. If, and you're going to have to pay for it, otherwise you're going to have total all 55 counties collapse uh, in on themselves on government functions. Now, um, Vernon Chris is the vice chair of the committee. You know, he was trying to quell some concerns about the way that that funding would be made up. We spoke to him about this resolution, and here's what he had to say. Regardless of what we do as far as the local share is concerned, the, the school aid formula, will kick in and make those whole anyway, as far as the majority of that is concerned. Our concerns right now will be how do you make the county commissions so they can run their county offices? How do you make the municipalities whole so that they don't lose out on any of their dollars and those types of things? That's probably where the concern is right now to make sure those things are backfilled as they come along. But again, it's not for us to say until something until the public decides that this is what they want. Coming up, reporter Brittany Patterson talks with lawmakers about the build out of natural gas pipelines in West Virginia. Supporters point to millions of dollars in economic benefits and thousands of jobs. But for some residents living in the path of these projects, pipelines have radically altered their way of life. We begin with Brittany's visit to Summers County. When Neil and Elizabeth LaFerrier moved to Summers County from Roanoke, Virginia about four years ago, they thought they had found a quiet, peaceful place to farm native medicinal herbs. As we were walking further and further through the property, we probably identified 40 or 50 different medicinal plants that just by walking along the logging road that was here at the time. This fall, less than a month after becoming organically certified, everything changed. On the 7th of September, myself, my four children, and our intern were out about a quarter mile down the road from where we sit here, uh, harvesting some ginseng and planting some of the berries and the seeds back uh, when a helicopter decided to fly over our property at a very low altitude. Seconds later, bright teal-colored pellets began to rain down from the sky. A couple of my children ended up with marks in their face. We all got hit pretty hard with them. The LaFerriers quickly realized the helicopter was working for Mountain Valley Pipeline. Weeks after they purchased Blackberry Springs Farms EQT, the developers of the 303-mile project began mapping its route. The 42-inch interstate natural gas pipeline originates in northwestern West Virginia, crosses 11 West Virginia counties, and ends in southern Virginia. The family sold the project access to a few hundred feet of their property, but negotiated contingencies into the contract to ensure their 115-acre organic farm would not be impacted by pipeline construction. We wanted to make sure that, you know, we were protecting ourselves for future of what we wanted to do up here. But despite all of that planning, the couple could not prepare for what would be repeated dumping of erosion control pellets by Mountain Valley Pipeline on their property. After the September incident that impacted about 70 acres of their property, the LaFerriers immediately contacted pipeline officials. They filed reports with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, and multiple other federal and state agencies. Because the Mountain Valley Pipeline crosses through multiple states, it's primarily regulated by FERC. Neil says an inspector from FERC came out about 10 days after the incident with three pipeline representatives in tow. We took... MVP and FERC down the road, showed them all across this road from here all the way down to a quarter mile past where pellets were dropped all over the place. I asked him, I said, you know, is, is there anything that can be done to clean this up? And he said, no, there's absolutely nothing we can do to clean it up. Once it gets wet, it's there. 
There was nothing these organic farmers could do to clean up the substances dumped by Mountain Valley Pipeline. But pipeline representatives assured them nothing like this would ever happen again. The very next day, they start flying back over my property. And in this, this time, a different flight pattern. So they're covering other portions of my property. According to the EPA, the product that was dropped is called EarthGuard Edge. It acts like a glue to help prevent soil erosion and runoff after an area has been cleared. It's made from elements that could invalidate the farm's organic certification for three years. The couple says they've lost customers because they cannot guarantee their teas, herbs, and other products are fully organic. And they said when they sought help to hold Mountain Valley Pipeline accountable, they came up empty-handed. We tried calling the local sheriff, uh, Summers County. We tried calling the state police. Both of those people referred us over to the Summers County prosecuting attorney who basically said that, you know, they wouldn't do anything with it and that we should just call a local attorney. Um, So when it comes to being represented or how we feel about, you know, trying to get something done, we're abandoned. There is there is no agency that gave us the attention and gave this issue the attention that it deserved. I can't I can't fathom a corporation being held to lower standards than you or me would be. West Virginia University law professor Josh Frechet says when it comes to interstate natural gas pipelines like the Mountain Valley Pipeline and the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, FERC is the regulatory body. One of the challenges sometimes we see in this kind of production is law enforcement not being willing to get involved even if it isn't within their authority. Complaints can be filed with FERC. Uh, and they can be noted, but FERC doesn't have its own enforcement uh, on that front, and so it often comes right back to the state and local authorities. With multiple interstate natural gas pipelines under construction through West Virginia, another issue that has risen to the forefront of landowners' minds is the ability of pipeline developers to use eminent domain to take private property. For Braxton County resident Jim McAllister, that reality drove him to sign over a 3,500-foot right-of-way to Mountain Valley Pipeline. The pipeline almost evenly dissects his 140-acre property. It's a great big bat that they never take out to show you. They just talk about it. McAllister and his wife moved back to West Virginia full-time about a decade ago to be close to family. The property's dense, lush canopies make it a great place to hunt morel mushrooms. One day, they had hoped to be able to sell parts of it for development. McAllister held out for nearly two years before finally agreeing to sell the Mountain Valley Pipeline. He was able to negotiate stipulations into the contract. But even so, he is acutely aware that everything has changed. This is the first time I've been up here. Um... I, I really haven't wanted to come up because it, it you, you you have to find a place that you can keep it and visit it when you when you can deal with it. But I haven't I haven't reached that place totally all the, the way yet. But he estimates the area cleared by the pipeline will impact one third of his land. The break in the tree canopy is detrimental to morels, for example. During construction, the McAllisters had their gas shut off for five days without warning and were blocked in by equipment. Well, it's just shocking when they start to show up and you've got 20 guys or 30 guys up there and it's two or three weeks and they don't have a portage on. But while construction has been disruptive, what really worries him is if he and his family are safe near this high-pressure natural gas pipeline. I think I am most bothered by the fact that This is a technology that's in evolution and we're, they've picked our land to be their laboratory. Last June, TransCanada's newly installed Leach Express pipeline exploded near Moundsville. A federal investigation cited steep, landslide-prone conditions found across much of West Virginia as the likely cause. Increasingly, McAllister wonders who benefits from the pipeline that has forever altered his and so many others' land. My major aggravation is that we have state agencies and we have elected officials who were supposed to have hands-on and 
uh, have a, a way to determine the best way forward with these decisions, and none of them have been evident. None of them have been active. Uh, all of them are passive um, because it's a development. It's it, it's it, it's generating income, but those that will share in that income will be select and, and few, and they they won't uh, they won't by and large be West Virginian residents. I'm Brittany Patterson. We did reach out to Mountain Valley Pipeline. They declined to sit down with us or address specific concerns raised by landowners. But in an emailed statement, spokesperson Natalie Cox said the project had undergone four years of rigorous review and project developers have been, quote, patient in our attempts to consistently work with the handful of landowners that continue to oppose MVP's progress in the select areas along the route. <clears throat> Joining me now are Delegate Josh, Joshua Higginbotham and of Putnam County and Senator Stephen Baldwin of Greenbrier County. Thank you both for being with us today. Sure, thank you for the opportunity. We're happy to be here. Thanks. Uh, Senator Baldwin, I wanted to start with you um, because you've spoken to the Lair Ferrier family that we saw in the first part of this piece about the incident. Um, and in a September Facebook post, you concluded by saying that you, you would hold MVP accountable. Um, I'm wondering if you ever got the answers that you were seeking and if you found that you, you got that accountability that you wanted. Well, yes and no. I, I remember being particularly upset uh, in that moment. You know, I had constituents call me who run an organic farm. And that, as you could see from your piece that you did, was, was put in jeopardy, you know, potentially for a period of years. Um, they were also scared, you know, they've, they've got kids, they've got family, they were, they were scared by the experience. And I, I can understand that. Um, I think what really upset me the most is that they felt powerless. You know, they, they felt powerless to do anything about what had happened to them. And um, I, I feel that sense of powerlessness too. Um, you know, I did, I reached out to DEP immediately and um, they were very responsive to me, which I appreciated greatly and sent me a report not too long after um, with the information that you shared in your piece about what the um, particular substance was. But, you know, my research on that indicated that those, that substance should not be near a water source. And there are water sources all over those mountains. Um, so it, it leaves some lingering questions moving forward. Yeah. Well, obviously the piece that we saw is really focusing on concerns that landowners and, and folks who might be living near pipeline construction have. And, um, you know, I think another theme that we've heard throughout the legislature so far has been the economic benefits that have been brought by natural gas production and this pipeline build out, you know, um, I think our budget surplus is certainly partially a testament to that. Same with the job growth that we've seen in Northwestern West Virginia. Um, I'm wondering, Delegate Higginbotham, you signed on to House Resolution Number 6. Tell us a little bit about that resolution and why you decided to sure. sponsor it. Well, Brittany, thank you for having me on. Uh, House Resolution 6 simply recognizes the tens of thousands of jobs that have been created in West Virginia by the natural gas and oil industries. Uh, and, and first, let me respond to uh, uh, the, the, the piece that was just on, on, on the screen. Um, you know, I wish I had known about uh, that farm and that family. Uh, I, I certainly would have loved to, to call them. Uh, and I can assure you that I will certainly, after this conversation, will be looking into uh, the chemical compounds of, of uh, whatever it was that they were raining down on that farm. Uh, so we certainly don't want dangerous chemicals getting into the water stream. Uh, that's, that's a nightmare scenario. So House Resolution 6, as I said, recognizes the th the tens of thousands of West Virginians who are employed in this industry. Without the natural gas industry, without our severance tax, without the, the income taxes that are brought in from these jobs, we wouldn't have a budget surplus that we're seeing today. Uh, we wouldn't be able to focus on other economic development issues. We wouldn't be able to fully fund PEIA. And I don't believe that we would have the money for uh, an additional public employee and teacher pay raise. So, you know, there are positives and negatives to, to everything, and I hope that we can find a balance between safety and, and job growth. 
Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought up the word balance um, because I'm wondering, you know, these are massive infrastructure projects and we have multiple going on at the same time in West Virginia. Um, and the landowners that are featured here, you know, are by no means the only ones that we've spoken to. And so I'm wondering, um, where do you feel like the legislature can come in and provide a sense of balance? Do you think we're doing a good job right now in protecting people as we put in these major pipelines? Well, sure. I mean, I think that there's certainly work that still needs to be done uh, in terms of health and safety. Uh, you know, a lot of people think that many of these things are state regulations, but the reality is, as we just mentioned in the piece before, FERC controls a lot of these, these regulations, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and they control a lot of those health and safety regulations, water and air quality standards, uh, along with the EPA. Uh, and I'm, I'm not you know, deflecting to, to them, uh, but a lot of those regulations uh, where it involves interstate commerce, uh, where this is an interstate pipeline, uh, they do control many of those regulations. Uh, but certainly there is more that we can do here in the state. Uh, and I, I look forward to researching some of those some of those issues. Yeah. Senator Baldwin, any thoughts on maybe specific actions that you think might be helpful to to answering some of these challenges that we're seeing? Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah. I, <laughs> I think there are actions that we can take. Are we taking those now? No, I, I don't think we've done a very good job at that. Um, I mean, look, for example, just yesterday, the, there was a committee of the Senate looking at lowering water quality standards. The Mountain Valley Pipeline alone crosses um, over 600 water sources along its 300 miles. That, that's a lot of opportunities for something to go wrong, and there certainly are tremendous benefits to this for the state of West Virginia moving forward, but we've got to have balance. And just one example of how we, we have not yet achieved that, you know, I, I, I got a call from these folks. Well, just two weeks ago, I got a call from another constituent in Summers County who has a horse farm. Guess what was raining down on their property two weeks ago? As they called me, it was happening. Um, so it's continuing to happen. Um, we've got to find balance moving forward. We do not have enough folks on the ground uh, to enforce at this point. Uh, and, and we also, as a legislature, have to enforce um, proper standards. Yeah. Um, I was really struck by, by something that Neil said in the, in the piece, which was, you know, it floors him that a corporation could be held to what he feels are lower standards than he would be if he went and dumped something on someone's property. Um, you know, these companies building pipelines are here because we have the gas in, in this area. Um, are there, how do you think the state is doing and are there ways in which we might improve upon making sure that, you know, the companies we're allowing to be here are good stewards of our environment and of, of the people who are here? Well, sure. If I may, uh, you know, I, first let me say that I actually have a, a recently completed pipeline going through my district, uh, very close to, to my house, as a matter of fact. And, and for the most part, many of the, the hardworking men and women who, who help build that thing, they're respectful, they're, they're diligent employees who just want to work a, a, a long day and, and bring home a paycheck for their families. That, that's what they want. And, and I don't think that it's the intention of these workers to, to pollute or to, to do any dumping. Uh, unfortunately, that may be the, the, the result. And, and I, I agree with the Senator that, that we do need to uh, crack down on, on any companies that are violating the law. Um, the, the truth is, is that there aren't enough uh, people out there on the ground uh, investigating and making sure that these companies aren't destroying infrastructure and roads in the process. Um, TransCanada actually just recently wrote a multi-million dollar check to the state uh, to fix a lot of these roads. So, you know, I, I, I don't blame the, the workers. I, I just want to ensure that we have accountability. Sure, certainly. Yeah. Senator, your thoughts? Yeah, I would echo the delegate's comments. I mean, I, I'm a minister, and there's a young man in my congregation who actually has been working on the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, and it's been a tremendous thing for him. Um, he's making a heck of a lot more money than I ever will, and he's just out of high school. Um, and it's been a wonderful working experience for him and for his coworkers. 
Um, but, you know, I, I just keep thinking about, I don't know if folks realize, you mentioned the scope of the infrastructure. I don't know if folks realize how large these pipelines are. Uh, you, you do because you, you live near one delegate. Um, they are huge. Uh, and to think about the mileage that these cross, we need, we agree, we need enough folks and enforcement to be able to um, be sure we're doing the right things the right way. We just don't at this point. Definitely. Well, Delegate Joshua Higginbotham, Senator Stephen Baldwin, thank you both so much for, for coming on today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Brittany Patterson, energy and environment reporter. For everyone here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, thanks for watching and have a great evening. <laughs>